It's astonishing. Yeah, you better. Two, one, action. Hello everyone, welcome to Pro TV. thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm joined by Mikael from Black Magic today, how Hi, are Carl. you Mikael? Hi, not too bad, thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem at all, no problem at all. So the last time we were here, mm -hmm. we tried to cram an awful lot in. We tried to talk about basically Indeed. the entire, um, not just all the products, but also all the software behind That's right. your digital That's cameras. Right. There was a long one. There I was a lot in there. <laughs> yes. Today, I think, should be a little bit simpler. What, what are we talking yes. about today? Do you want to so introduce yeah, today it? Today, we are going to discuss the uh, video assist line of products. Mm -hmm. As you know, we do have four fantastic models available uh, for our customer out there. We're talking about the 3G model, we're talking about the 12G models in HDR. So I think it's a, it's a good time to actually dive into this kind of uh, technology and see sure. how they're really helpful um, for many different workflow because sometimes uh, people think about these products as a simple video monitor commodity and that's it. Sure. But actually it's got so much more into it, I believe. Absolutely, there's a reason you didn't call it the Blackmagic monitor recorder, it's the video <laughs> assist, it does all sorts of different that's things. That's right, and, that's right. And there's nothing necessarily new here, these products have been on the market for a good few years now, haven't they? Um, they weren't all launched, I don't think all four were launched at the same time, but they've mm. sort of, Not they've really, all been think out for a few years. We, they are, yeah, they've been out for a few years. Um, Actually, strange enough, the, the 3G version are newer than the 12G mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm. again, um, in typical Blackmagic uh, way, if we can make it a bit more affordable um, <laughs> you to, to the customer, we will try always to accommodate that. So if there is no need of the 12G data rate, for example, a 3G would be perfectly fine. Absolutely. Yes. No, it makes perfect sense to have some more affordable version. Um, and I, th I think that they are something in your product portfolio that often gets overlooked a little bit because right. at the end of the day yes they've got all these other fancy tricks which we'll talk about in a minute at their core they're a decent monitor yep. everyone needs a decent monitor 
And they're a Blackmagic Raw recorder. That's right. And we get a lot of positive feedback about Blackmagic Raw and a lot of positive feedback about Resolve. Um, Resolve is universally sort of people seem to really appreciate Resolve and, and either use it already or would, would like yeah. to change over to it if they were able to. Um, and Blackmagic Raw is such a robust raw codec. Indeed, indeed. And these are th- that missing piece of the puzzle that mm-hmm. if you don't already use a Blackmagic camera, yep. getting your Blackmagic like Raw your gateway to, your to, to that exactly. sort of workflow where you can see Blackmagic Raw, we discussed that before, it's so powerful and you need a way to get into perhaps Resolve somehow with a maybe camera which is not a Blackmagic, hence a video assist becomes your portal to, to that world and it's yeah in, in that case it's, it's fantastic the, the work that we put into into that sort of uh relationship that we have with third-party camera manufacturer for mm. example mm. is is great is immense we really trying to stay in touch and stay close <coughs> to them to make sure that they can extrapolate the maximum from their own system so we're glad that we are so close to them and the engineering um our team can work Absolutely. together to accommodate this sort of workflow, which, as we said, is very, very efficient. Sure. So we're, let's let's go through it um, absolutely now. But I think as we do, any comment, I can see a couple of questions have been left already, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, leave any questions that you might have as we go while you're watching this, um, and if they're relevant to what we're talking about at the time. I will bring them up. Also, apologies if I'm coughing throughout. I've got one of these really irritating little coughs <laughs> that just won't go away. So sorry if that's really irritating throughout that whole stream. <coughs> there we go. There you go. By the <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, I realise I haven't really introduced you in your role. Of course, we did that last time. But should we do yeah. a very quick little um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, overview? Currently, I'm covering the position of a... Um, senior technical sales specialist uh i got a, a bit of focus on more like the digital um cinema uh camera and digital camera in general mm-hmm. however been covering a different roles in within the company been working with them for the last 10 12 years 12 years this year sure Actually, you bounced around time, yeah. but... i bounced around a little bit uh but yeah now back to uh my first uh, uh kind of love which was camera in general Absolutely. Uh, so but i got the looks of knowing quite a lot about every other uh, black magic solution including the video assist which is somehow a product which goes very well uh, and it tags along the the camera um uh, product that we we have so we use it, it quite extensively all three worlds it does, doesn't it, it, a little does. Bit, yeah. it, it kind of covers all, the, few all the bases like that. that's right that's right well let's have a look at what we're going to discuss today uh, i prepared something very very quick obviously we will have a look at the at the video assist as a uh, as a uh, as a hardware from the hardware point of view describe what it's all about uh build the functionality behind it um certainly the the use as a as a monitoring tool but also the tools inside the the video assist which are very beneficial to um uh, general engineering uh, purposes so to analyze the the signals and, and many more uh features that we got over there then i'd like to bring up some workflow example because as we said mm. it doesn't only work in a uh, as a as a video um sort of recorder or monitoring but many other uh, aspects of it can be used in so many different workflows which i like to to explore the streaming and encoding uh capability of it and obviously, we will answer some question on, on the go, okay? Um, so yeah, quick and easy. Um, I think this picture already says a, a lot about what the camera, uh, what, what the video assist um, is all about. It's an amazing um, field uh, portable recorder, um, but um, it's got some, some of the feature there, including scopes um, and the ability of, um, uh, of, uh, of streaming uh, included into it. I think, as we mentioned earlier, we've got a 3G version and a 12G uh, yeah, version Yeah, let's of go it. over that a little bit, because I think yes. we, can, we can band those terms about 3G yeah. and 12G, and some people at home might be saying, yeah, exactly. I don't actually so know what that means. It is, it is really important to define what your data rate um, uh, you're working with uh, when you're talking about video obviously 3g mm. being a maximum of 1080p uh, 50 uh, resolution and frame rate when you go up to 6g we are now talking about the ultra hd up to p30 and when you are tackling 12g uh, workflow that will will allow you to work with ultra hd at p50 or p60 in that case and these models sort of uh cover all the bases so if, when you look at them we got 
two model for the 12G uh, version, one in uh, five inches and the one in seven inches. And then you got the same version in 3G. Mm -hmm. There are some differences there, which we will go through in a minute. Yeah, it's not as simple as just the 12G ones are 4K and the, the 3G ones are 1080p, no. though, is it? Because the, the, no, that's exactly. really only talking about the SDI port. That's the, the SDI port. will do the same. That's right, that's right. Um, it's, it, exactly, so we got, uh, we got the same sort of like form factor but behind the scene there is something else obviously the 12g <laughs> also include an hdr um, panel and screen that means that you got a very bright uh, 2500 nit um, uh, screen perfect for outdoor condition the 3g don't feature that but obviously there are uh there are equally uh equally powerful in terms of um in terms of the the other functionality including the the scopes and including the, the recording options okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah first of all um you can see from the difference between the 3g and the 5g is actually the sdi connectors those sdi connectors are uh, in the small version the five inches are micro bnc Whereas on the on the seven inches version, you do have the full size BNC over there, okay, for professional broadcast um, mm -hmm. connectivity. Uh, a common trait on these VDCs are they are battery powered as well as DC power, mm -hmm. because being a field monitor uh, per se, then it will require to be sometime used in, in a, with, with with some batteries or without any leads to mm -hmm. it. So these are these are quite nice, um, and obviously you've got a couple of them um, available for for the video assist. And again, we will look into the um, into the the other features we mentioned. There is also a uh, per per perfect tool for uh, engineering purposes with the scopes, waveforms, we've got vector scope, we will, uh, we will see that in a minute. And again, one thing that sits behind them, which is quite important, is again, the Blackmagic OS system. Yes. So the Blackmagic OS system, which is so popular in our camera solution, is very, very similar in the video assist. So again, you feel very much at home whenever you touch and use these, uh, these video assist. Everything is exposed. Everything is uh, very much in context to what you need to uh, use and see on the on the video assist. Something that uh, sometimes is a bit annoying when you're using your um, local LCD on your camera and you see this, this information are somehow um, um, uh, preventing you from looking at the picture uh, correctly. So these are a nice, uh, it's a nice way, there's a nice way the information is actually laid out on the monitor itself, okay? In fact, you can see here how, how nicely this is actually designed. Um, it shows uh, it shows a lot how much care we put into the design of the uh, user interface, and not only obviously. Um, another feature here in the in the video assist, which uh, is probably uh, worth mentioning, is the the ability of loading the lookup table. Um, so when you use these um, uh, this device, not only as a video assist in terms of like video monitoring, but in terms of player that can becomes quite useful on field when you're trying to perhaps apply something on a uh, on a display monitor or a director monitor so you so, can apply a lot in the monitor and absolutely. it will show it on the monitor yes. but then it will also send that out over the monitor's you output to, you, so you that you can feed control. video village with you got a, full control over that okay right. and obviously the hdr screen we mentioned that um earlier it's a 2500 nits on the 12g uh version therefore you can expect quite a quite a bright uh, monitor in, in outdoor condition mm -hmm. and also the, this will carry the flag of the HDR, HDR and will be triggered automatically when you plug an HDMI for example into it so it will automatically switch into that and you will have a nice flag saying yes you are now uh, sourcing an HDR feed into it okay um, briefly on the connectivity and the media as we said this is also a field recorder um, and that means that you need to have the ability of recording these somehow in a device. You have uh, a couple of options, the SD cards, um, 
are um, one of the one of the options in the big version so the seven inches version you do have two slots available for the sd card in the 3g version sorry on the five inches version you do have one slot but the beauty of it is yeah, that, that is the also, same across that's right the 12g that's that's right it's uh it's it's, uh, it's across the the two model 12g or the th or the 3g version doesn't really matter okay mm -hmm. and the size doesn't really really matter as well on the website there is a list of certified sd cards to be used mm -hmm. with it um so you make sure you, you can make sure that for example if you're tackling an hd workflow rather than an ultra hd you got the card which could uh, potentially work with it 90 megabit per second is different from 300 megabit per second therefore will allow you to eventually record ultra hd or hd depending on the on the on the model yep. And then the other option would be the USB-C external recording. Okay, so yeah. at the bottom of the uh, of the video assist, you have a USB-C multifunction port. Mm. That means that it could be used, for instance, for external recording. Okay, so you can plug in a typical uh, Samsung T7 or T5 or whatever and record onto that. So again, sort of overcoming the limitation of an SD capacity in that, in yeah, that sense, absolutely. okay? And the speed as well, okay? Mm. But and it's also that, quite a nice workflow to record mm -hmm. onto a drive and then just take the drive and just plug into a computer right. and start editing right. straight away. It's, it's, it's super, super easy, um, especially again, when we, when we talk about the Blackmagic Pro, as we mentioned earlier, that mm. becomes literally a nice, uh, quick and easy way to, to get into the exactly. uh, editing suite quite rapidly. Um, just to finish off on the connectivity as well, we mentioned we've got <coughs> professional SDI or uh, micro uh, yes. BNC, depending on the size, on the on the five inches or the seven inches. But you have noticed as well, the full size uh, Type-B um, HDMI ports over yeah. there. Uh, these are in and out and you say, wow, in and out. So that means that you can technically use it almost as a distributor of your signal because those outputs both the SDI and the HDMI are constantly open and functioning simultaneously. So you feed, HDMI so you can in, feed an HDMI in, you get and HDMI out, HDMI and, and SDI, SDI out, out and Brilliant. the other way around as well. Okay, Brilliant. so SDI in will become basically so it's a, a converter. converter as well. Is actually a converter. Yep. Um, and then something which That's some, something I constantly forget. That the video yeah, does that. exactly, exactly, like a distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing which some, sometimes people tend to neglect is the audio capability of these devices. You can see on the um, on the um, on the five inches, uh, you do rely on the on the uh, embedded SDI, but on the seven inches instead, both the twelve G and the um, the three G, you do have the um, you do have the XLR uh, capability, which is quite nice because obviously you can have analog input there and you mm -hmm. will talk about that uh, uh, in a second in fact the reason why i said sometimes people neglect this aspect is because maybe they rely on their uh inbuilt microphone on their on their camera on third party camera for scratch audio but actually when plugging the um the xlr on the on the video assist the noise floor of this device is fantastic again i'm not going into the nitty-gritty of this graph but you can see obviously purple uh pink it would be the typical dslr noise floor of a of a camera compared to what we offer on the video seats so the sound is crystal clear uh, in that respect so we're talking about a, so that, that's not the scratch mic that's the that's the mic input that's the mic on input the, on the xlr on the, for example or on, on the, the DSLR, exactly on just the, thinking what are you comparing it against there okay so this is okay pretty much the noise floor that you get uh, against a typical DSLR. So this is really, really uh, interesting if you're trying to hook up like a shotgun mic uh, mm. and you're trying to get the most out of your uh, of your camera. Uh, one nice things we mentioned earlier is the use of uh, the battery with this uh, uh, with this device, which sometimes can be used as a simple backup when you are DC powered. But if you're not, if you're on field, you do have the ability of using it with uh, uh, with a couple of uh, uh, Sony batteries over there. The system is very easy. Pretty much every uh, every uh, device that has a dual battery in our system works in the same way now, which is a serial discharge. So once the first battery goes down it will go onto the second one and uh, and and then obviously that will trickle charge 
uh, when you DC power the unit, the first one which is uh, uh, empty. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's quite that's quite nice. You must have noticed as well also the tally light on top of the uh, of the video assist. Yep. Again, a little a little touch that is quite interesting to have when you when you do record that. You can even disable that if you if you don't need to. Sometimes it could be intrusive. Therefore, you want you you might want to check the brightness level of your tally light uh, mm. for recording. Okay, so that's something that is quite nice and interesting to have. Because we touch upon the um, the storage and the ability of recording on that, those SD cards and the USB-C, um, I'd like to discuss what the codec availability is in these devices, which is, I think, um, something that is really important if you're coming from the photographic world and if you've got uh, maybe, again, third-party camera and you're trying to enhance the the way the, your, your signal is captured, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some of those uh, photographic camera or the codec offered within those camera are not extremely friendly. Some of them are 8-bit, some of them are proprietary. So you might want to have something a bit more flexible, a bit more friendly. And I think having the ability of, of um, uh, offering ProRes and DNX, which are probably the most popular 10-bit codec out there, is, is, a nice, uh, is a nice thing to have. Again, <coughs> the graph shows quite nicely uh, how much you can record into uh, in that case is, is, an, is an SD card in both ProRes uh, and DNX, and you can see it's quite uh, it's quite efficient uh, even at the uh, at the highest um, at the highest setting, which could be the ProRes 422 HQ. So that's that's quite nice having having almost like a, a 45 slash 50 minutes recording in that uh, in that 256 gigabyte in 4K is really really nice. Sure. So and again that means that you can have a quality codec now coming from your third-party camera if you don't have it available and then that means that you got more flexibility in post-production to push and pull the information without having those uh, unfortunately those compromises to be made when you're using 8-bit codec those little cameras are fantastic because these they sensor are beautiful but unfortunately they they have to compromise it on on the on the recording side to allow you to record maybe a maximum resolution maybe in 4k so you rely on the hdmi capability and the fact that they can sort of send a clean output to it so we take advantage of that and we give that back to the to the customer so which is great Right, let's pause on this screen for a little bit because yeah. this is this is the crux of that, that <laughs> magic raw part is what cameras can actually mm -hmm. feed that. Um, we've had a few questions about this. For yeah. example, um, Patrick has said, when recording on a video assist with a Z cam, is it B raw or Z cam color science that you end up with, or is it a mixture of the two? So you end up with a with a black magic raw because again, we really work closely with the manufacturer themselves so sure. is from their side or from our side to make sure that we can open the uh the black magic crawl to accommodate their sensor information yes okay so that's the thing so, so you won't get the is. sensor information the sensor exactly. is different and the different sensor cameras. does its own work yep. it's only the way we wrap it and we take obviously those information from their sensor so they manage yep. that side of things and we wrap it into the black magic crawl so you end up with the sort of like their color science in a way, but wrapped in a more agile uh, black magic crawl. When you hear when people hear black magic talking about things like color Gen Five color science yeah. and black magic raw, all of that would apply to black magic raw recorded on one of these cameras, that's right. as well as black magic raw recorded in a black magic. That's camera. right. That's right. So you got the same sort of flexibility then in in post production, ending up with all the information in twelve bit. With, with with the native acquisition from those cameras, the one that you've seen here, we've got over now 30 uh, different models mm -hmm. uh, available. And again, we work very, very closely to these manufacturers. Some of them really push the, push the limit. Uh, we've seen surprisingly also going beyond what they what we thought the mm. capability of our of our unit were uh in in some of the instances even going beyond the resolution allowed to record in the individual system some in some of them so that was uh, that was quite staggering to see how close these these team work together mm. so rather than sounding like a close environment actually these people 
are in touch constantly with us and we try to cater and, and help them out as much as they can. So we can see this list growing, growing and mm. growing. So which is, uh, which is well, a beautiful some, thing to do. Some standouts on here. I mean, obviously the, yeah. the Panasonic list and the Fuji list is the longest by a long way there. I mean, Panasonic, it basically covers everything. Yeah. They may including the S5 Mark II and the S5 Mark II X down there, which is brilliant. Um, Fuji, uh, G GFX, yeah, GFX 100, 100 2, yes. XH2S, XH2, yeah, yeah, yeah. XT5, all fantastic Absolutely. Um, video cameras. The Nikons, the Z7, no, Z8, Z9. Not yet, no. Not yet. And, and, and again, you know, this is a process. And yeah. every time we do that, we have to initiate that because we know that Blackmagic Raw is really tapping into a specific you know sensor so it is not just a wrapper yes, it's, it's, it's not, not easy just, to add exactly so you need yep. to have those information from both sides <laughs> yeah, to make yeah, sure yeah. you extrapolate the, the best out of those sensor again it's not a wrapper it's not a bucket of pixel that you wrap into something is really intimately working with that very specific sensor. It's mm. not tied into it, so mm. that's the beauty because it's open, so that means that we can accommodate all of them. Yeah. But every time we, they come out with something new, we will have to do some work to make sure we take out, you know, take the most out of it. So, I've had a lot of questions <laughs> on, um, I think you can guess the topic. Uh, one before the stream even started, Ariel said, um, <laughs> if only Sony and Blackmagic joined to record B Raw in cameras like the FX3 and A7S Mark III, the workflow in DaVinci would be so much better. Um, I've had people say, um, where was it? Will the Canon R6 Mark II get Blackmagic Raw support? Um, will you add Resolve support for ProRes RAW? If not, could you talk to more camera manufacturers to add Blackmagic RAW support for their for your recorders? Yeah. The the ones that aren't on the list and they're really Sony is the big name that is not on yeah. that list. Um, and can the only camera can a camera on there is the C three hundred Mark II, which is you know it's a it's an older camera now. That's right. Um, and high end camera as well. Yeah. Um, we can only hope what, really that you know um, we are kind of like very open in that sense yeah we, we mentioned many times that black magic raw is sort of like a um an, an open standard in the way that yeah we, we will help them out as much as they want us to help them so uh, the the opportunity is always there therefore the more uh option we got available and, and the more this this partner will will uh, will come forward with their solution we will try our best to, to accommodate them all so it's uh, it's really down to sometimes it's also timing um it's it's not easy to stress that engineering time to so many options out there and we know how this market is now becoming uh bigger and wider so there are many many options so uh we we'll try to cater for as much as we possibly can and yes it's great to see there is also demand uh for more option out there which i'm sure they're super super interesting and again we are very focused on black magic raw at the moment um and that's why you know i also understand when people coming from saying well would you be able to offer it to more camera manufacturer it's is out there the sdk is out there so it's it is an easy reach uh, whether that can become a reality I hope that would become uh, more like of a, uh, I mean, a standard. But I, yeah. I guess, do customers need to pester Canon and Sony? Or do they need to pester Blackmagic? Or do they need to pester both? Uh, do pester both. Is pester always both. The best <laughs> Split your best. Split your best. <laughs> you'll, be, exactly. you'll be fine over there. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll do our bit. We, we wait for them to also do their bit. And, and hopefully, you know, you will see this list expanding more and more uh, yeah. over the course of the year. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, another thing which I think it, some, some people don't really know or maybe they don't come across that often is the um, is the ability of these video assist device to um, have a uh, have the ability of recording the metadata and you can input this metadata and back to what we were saying about then the workflow within DaVinci Resolve these are essential information that you are mm. gonna get from this device which then can be used inside of into Resolve and create your uh, your bean, your smart beans based on those information. And that slate is really, really <coughs> critical. You get clips information, you get project information, lens data, mm -hmm. if they happen to travel across with a pogo pin in your camera. So these are very, 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 very nice touches that we 
can attach to the video system to your workflow. So it's, again, something that sometimes is not really uh, uh, standing out, but is there to be used. Now, moving forward, this is also an interesting uh, side of the of the video assist family is the monitoring tools and the feature that you you get uh, with these uh, with these this, things. You know, it's not the most fully fledged monitor mm -hmm. on the on the market in terms of the, the amount of tools that are in there. Mm -hmm. But the tools that are in there are the same tools that are in your camera, which have always That's had right. very good sort of feedback on. That's right. We hear time and time again from customers that the peaking is one of the best peaking mm -hmm. on the market, which is something so small and simple. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. you'd be amazing how some you'd be amazed at some how some manufacturers Absolutely. do get that wrong. I think uh, and the false colours. The false exactly. Well. I was about to mention. I think my favourite one again <laughs> are the peaking and the uh, and the false colour. Yeah. However. I think it is important to understand that other tools are also quite, uh, um, first of all, quite useful mm -hmm. um, and really beneficial when you're trying to make sure that your signal is uh, appropriate to, for, for delivery. Uh, and that, those are the, the scopes tools. So when we're yes. talking about uh, the waveform, for example, or um, the luminance monitoring tool, the luminance scope uh, sometimes referred to, uh, is super, super important, especially if you're doing some broadcast mm. work, you mm. need to make sure that you know exactly where your signal is sitting, you know how to read the waveform, you know that when, you, when you're actually hitting the, the one volts or the, um, or the 100 IRE, you, you are blowing out the picture and there is no information over there, the opposite is true, when you go below zero, the information is lost. So you need to understand how to read these, uh, um, these, uh, this waveform. This is only for the luminance, but sometimes you can go even further uh, and actually analyze these within a, an RGB parade, which actually sort of analyze the strength of the and the saturation of each individual channel. So you want to be you want to make sure that obviously this information comes across equally, or somehow they stay within the the range expected for for delivery. So these are really really important tool. Another one which is important sometimes is also the the vector scope to see uh, how the um, how the, the the signal is actually uh, maybe casting a particular color or where it's pushing in the direction of a or a dominant color like RGB. But you can see in the vector scope you also got access to the secondary color, color so magenta, the cyan. Um, so that's uh, that is really important to see uh, where the saturation is in the in the color and where does it actually go through. Um, and another one, obviously, this is probably the easiest one. Uh, I. I, I don't use that often, the uh, the histogram. Uh, it, it belongs maybe to different aspects of the production. I've seen this used in, in post-production more like when, when you're used to like, you know, um, typical to like Photoshop, so people are used to these kind of uh, uh, tools. But for me, it just allow me to understand where they, uh, where the dynamic range is sitting uh, um, in, in the signal to make sure I, I use the dynamic range correctly of my camera. So it tells me a bit more about that. You can easily uh, split the signal into uh, low light, mid and, and high light and see pretty much what are you, where are you sitting over there. Um, perhaps a bit more useful, um, not as much as the luminance tool, so the waveform is the Zebra. Again, it's useful because not many people will spend their time analyzing the, the waveform, but they might have instead a, a useful way and quick way to reference the um, the highlight um, clipping here so the zebra is, is available. Um, and don't forget that these tools, the one that we mentioned, the waveform, the vectorscope, can actually uh, be used as an overlay or be used as a um, uh, as a normal scope with a picture in picture of the of the image so you can decide what which way you want to kind of like show them um, and one that we mentioned instead is really important to uh, get uh, get your understanding get your head around is the false color instead I think this is really important I use it all the time to nail my skin tone uh, I use it all the time this, this to, false color is my most used exposure yeah, exactly. tool. But I think the, it's, the nice thing about the video system is that it's got all of those in it. And, yeah. you know, that that's important because each person has their own way that they do it. I've yeah. got loads of customers that use zebras way more than any of the others. And I agree. Along, and as long as, long as you're fine. not you the one the saying, oh, why can I not use just my video to do it, to assess it? Sure, well, yeah. because each panel, each LED panel, each video could be 
slightly different and your you eyes know your eyes could be light you different all the, time. The, the the tiredness of your yeah. eyes the environment where you you're using this device the lighting around you they all contribute to a different sort of yep. bias and judgment and false color and instrument like waveform don't Absolutely. lie instead false color in, in fact was designed in the past just for those sort of nuances where you could see variation in color where your eyes might not be so accurate. That's, that's why we're using this kind of like very loud and different colors. So people, people sometimes ask, why do you use this pink and green and things like that? Because our colors do really stand out well, on to, subtle you know, areas. That which image, you don't. for example, you can look at that for two seconds exactly. and you can see her hair boom, is boom, boom, underexposed. Boom. The, the highlights on the, um, on the window frame are clipping. And her skin is in vaguely the right place. That's right. That's right. Great. You, that's great. So there's no way that you could have actually nailed that if I was showing you the picture in that particular area because it was mm -hmm. so underexposed that maybe you're losing some of the touches, some of the sure. nuances of the of the image itself. So these tools are the one that you really want to use to nail your uh, your exposure along with the waveform if you have the time to to go through that. So while we're on that, um, yeah. Patrick says, this is why we would like to see EL Zone in the future. Mm -hmm. Are you guys aware of EL Zone? Is that something that's on your radar at all, do you know? Um, I'm not sure whether this is under the radar. Sometime we have to wait until, obviously, the, the PM maybe uh, <laughs> collect this feature request, and we are always open to collect feature requests and, and pass it over. It's not I, the first time that we've been asked. That would be certainly a very beneficial a good one. one to add on the so, list. yeah, definitely something to add if on the feature request. If anyone at home is, is not aware of what EL is, and, or, or even is aware, but it has a bit mm -hmm. of misunderstanding, because I, I do come up against this with customers quite a lot, where they think EL Zone is just a better false colour. And... It is for some work, but not for others. I would strongly yeah. argue that they are different tools. EL is basically um, much more colors. So if we just go back to the false color scope, um, yeah. on here you've got a couple of colors representing underexposed, a couple of colors representing overexposed, and a couple of colors representing the middle, the 18% gray, and one stop over, aka skin tone. That's tones. right. So it's very, very quick and simple. You only see those areas. Am I over, under, and what is my skin, is it? EL Zone has about 30 or 20 colors or whatever. It's like and it, mapping. It's, it's mapping a single <laughs> stop of dynamic range to each color. So the result is this multicolored wool. So it's much less useful for very quickly interpreting an image like that. So I personally, for my work, would st I still use false color more than I use EL Zone. Reason being, I'm working very quickly. I'm looking at a monitor across the room and going, is my skin correctly exposed? Yes, that's right. Going. Toggle it on, toggle it off, done. EL zone is much more useful for sitting back, looking at your scene and analysing, oh, what's going on on those shadow area behind that, yeah. um, that stall over there? You know, in like a slower paced narrative world where you're crafting the lighting and you're saying... You know, or even, maybe even in virtual really production, useful. even features, when you use like green screens or green anything screens like is great it, for is really cool. And if you're coming back to redo a scene, it's mm -hmm. a great tool for that as well because um, extremely precise with that. You can be very precise and say you need to relight the exact same scene. Okay, cool. I've got like a paint by numbers cheat code That's as right. to how bright I had each light in what area. So as long as I can correctly remember or I've noted down where I put my lights physically, yep. I can easily dim them to the right amounts. Based and on once my again, by numbers. if you got the luxury though of that time that you can spend to craft your sure, uh, your image, it's a slower. It's a slower process. It's a slower approach. Where actually full score is more immediate. And in this a way. is what I come up against with customers time and time again. And That's primarily, right. these tools are designed to speed you up while you're working and be fast-paced working tools That's right. rather than those That's right. slower ones primarily. Um, and so, hence why why. Uh, EOZO might not be included right at the moment, but I would definitely um, one for add the, my name to the list. Yeah, yeah. One for the, for, for the dev team. <laughs> I'd love to see Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, because we're talking about workflow and in 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 which way we can use and deploy these um, these video sets, I'll uh, I like to have a look at some of them, starting from the very very basic. Sometime um, I mentioned to you um, earlier that we do have a USB C port. Uh, yes. on the video assist and sometimes people do neglect that because first of all it's at the bottom so it's not very visible and sometimes they do believe it's only for updates it's not it's a multi-function port um, meaning that I mentioned already one of the features which was recording on an external drive but that also work as a 
peripheral, a USB-C peripheral to your computer, yep. meaning that your, uh, your computer now sort of uh, understand that device to be a UVC device, like a yep. webcam. And in that case, you can see what the consequences of that is. Yep. It could be your media player sometime or your portal to a VoIP system. So that's 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 very very beneficial if you need something to play back something in your uh, conferencing um, um, tool, then you have a, you you have a you have a solution. Or maybe again, you want to um, input something from your camera HDMI camera into that uh, into that tool. There you go. You got a better camera behind that. In fact, the second example um, uh, is very very similar, but at the back of the video series, rather than having a playback as a recording and playback uh, device, I have a Micro Studio Camera 4K a G2. And in this case, the video assist function does actually double act. First of all, we know that the, the new Micro Studio Camera 4K is a compact body without monitoring. Therefore, I do need to set it up somehow. And to do so, I need a visual representation of the menu, which could be done by the HDMI and again, we still got the free SDI port, so I can do two things. Mm -hmm. HDMI in HD in one input, set up my camera, and then send the 4K SDI output of my Micro Studio camera into the video assist. Flick through the SDI, and there you have it. <coughs> you can start recording while also then sending the same signal to your preferred uh, VoIP platform. Obviously, we only mentioned a few, but these one are uh, the the one we uh, see them use the most. I mean, it is UVC, right? So that's right. It's just that's right. recognized it's by pretty, any piece of software. Pretty much, that can it's, see it's down webcam. to the OS system to recognize that device more yeah. than anything else. Um, and of course, we do have the same HDMI port enable as we mentioned earlier. Therefore, the signal doesn't actually hit the buckle there. It can carry on. It can go through it sure. and go to the maybe an HDMI monitor device so that is uh that's perfect in in that sense how can we expand these uh workflow um even further or how can we can enhance what we got available we seen that we use a micro studio camera uh 4k g2 uh in the previous example but sometimes you don't have access to a bmd camera you're using something else and again having the ability of taking that third party HDMI clean feed output, getting into the video assist. Perhaps you also want to enhance your audio quality and you do have the XLR input for your microphone with phantom power, with the XLR input. I think the, the beauty of this is that on the 12G version HDR, you also have the ability of mapping where these XLR channel do go to on the SDI output. So you can mm. have some, some channel mapping uh, as well uh, going on. And again, everything then gets translated into the uh, UVC, USB-C output once again, going to your uh, VoIP system. So it's, uh, it's an amazing way to get the most out of your current um, uh, devices and then extrapolate a good signal out of yeah. it. I mean, and this is the sort of thing that I think a lot of people forget. Yeah. That these video sites. It's a Swiss do. knife. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. way more than just a film monitor. So it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. You can see here with the next example how this is also relevant for a uh, current little um, um, streaming studio or alternative to, to this. Uh, in this instance, for example, we do have a an Atom Mini attached to it, which actually is, is taken as a source of three different signals coming from three different uh, camera, uh, Blackmagic camera. So is, the Atom is taking care of that aspect of the of the production. But maybe then you want to record this this um, this product, and maybe mm. an ATM Mini and ATM SDI didn't have the ability of a dual USB C port, so mm. I was losing the ability of streaming directly from the USB C, okay, because I need to record. So to give an alternative <coughs> to that and not losing the ability of of streaming over RTMP over the Ethernet port, I can then send the auxiliary output of the ATM Mini to the video assist which instead, obviously in turn, will carry on with that USB-C uh, capability of streaming over the VoIP. So while, of course, acting as your program. While as, as well. Prog <laughs> is recording your program, yep. is sending that to the USB-C, is inputting that uh, XLR audio input. So yeah, is is acting, uh, acting as basically the center point of your distribution as well. In fact, if you look at the next one, 
I'm using it to the full extent of it, where now I got rid of the uh, of the VoIP, say, uh, platform, but I'm using a software layer, perhaps, like OBS. So mm -hmm. the USB-C will reach the, the software layer, and as you mentioned earlier, it is just a webcam. So mm -hmm. whatever is enabled as uh, with this kind of input will be available to your uh, to your software layer. Um, but at the, main time, at the same time, I'm also sending this signal over SDI to maybe a capture device, happen to be a Declink card, which could be installed in a playout system, perhaps, okay, or a graphic system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can have multiple um, uh, multiple uses of that. And again, the HDMI output will go to maybe a monitor or a projector or any other output. So it's doing exactly the same thing, is catering for a streaming layer, is going to a uh, Declan device, IO output, is going to an HDMI, is recording internally, is is acting as your portal between, as a, as a monitoring device for your 18 mini. So it's, 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 it's doing a lot in one go. You can even monitor the audio with a, with an headset because sometimes people, they used to have a, uh, just an ATEM uh, SDI without the, the audio um, uh, output capability, meaning an headset, are almost like asking, how do I monitor my audio from there? Well, the headset in the uh, in the video assist allow you to plug in your uh, your 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 your, uh, your headset and monitor that as well. So there is a lot behind this uh, little device that we, which can actually cater for so many different workflow as we've seen so far. Absolutely. Should we? Pause there a minute and go before we wrap things up yes, and go through a bunch of the questions that have been coming because I've been holding some some back. Some, <laughs> some are questions, some are sort of more statements of people's uh -huh. thoughts. Um, this was quite an interesting one. Brandon, um, right near the beginning, said the Odyssey 7Q was ahead of its time, specifically having the ability to live switch and record. Mm. Any thoughts about doing that all-in-one device that is a monitor too? Odysseys still sell because of that feature. And it, uh, it's an interesting one to bring up because, you know, if any co company is going to do that, Blackmagic seems the right company to do it, right? You guys are the switching <laughs> company. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting interesting concept. Um, uh, of course, if that were ever going to happen, that would be a completely different uh, iteration of a of a product or probably a oh, sure, totally it's different, in this. different, yeah. different model uh, altogether. It's a, a More different like an technology ATEM behind. A screen than... It would be a different technology behind yeah. that altogether, I'm sure. But it would be it would be great to see those worlds yeah. mix, um, mix a little bit. Um, HDX Art says I will buy an external recorder that has the ability to delete the last recorded clip. Mm. Even Area Lexus have this option. This risk should be up to the user to decide. The risk should be up to the user to decide whether they want it or not. It's true. Um, uh, so there's no deleting in there's the video no deleting option. At all. Again, uh, I partly agree with that. Uh, mm. For uh, for any skilled operator out there, there is probably an equal number of people that unfortunately do do have different ways to approach the, the device and, and just don't realize they don't that. really realize what they're doing and they find yep. themselves in, in trouble. Yep. And we certainly don't want that. So that is, is a feature, I guess, we've we seen, which we seen before, but we might much rather be on the safe side of yeah, things rather than cautious. actually having problem and get caught uh, in a situation where you haven't got that <laughs> shot. Absolutely. Um, a really good question, actually, from Peter. It says, I've both the 5-inch and the 7-inch. I would love to know if you can set the HDMI and SDI output to a specific resolution. I've noticed when recording 6.2K OpenGate or 8K B-RAW, the output signal on HDMI changes. Can I, like I can on the Atomos Ninja, set the output to be always 1080p as my wireless sender only supports 1080p? Effectively acting as a down converter. No, um, it'll be fixed to the input resolution uh, in that respect. So it doesn't have a, a, a cross conversion capability inside. Yep. Therefore, whatever is on the EDID process will be maintained on the on the output. Yes. Cool. So and that's something that is hardware locked. That's yes. not something that can be added in firmware with feature requests. So put it down as a feature request for Absolutely. next generation, perhaps, but. Yeah. There's there's no chance of the current units yeah. being able to do that, sadly. Um, <coughs> similarly, uh, Norm says the Blackmagic Video says 5 inches is a great little monitor, but the SDI inputs, I guess he means the size of them, um, are problematic. Would it be possible to have regular BNC connections like those available on the small HD? 
Um, I mean, the seven inches is the, the option. Seven inches in, in is, the is the option, that. really, on the lineup. Yes. Yeah. Um, some people do use our. Um, mini bnc to a female bnc yes. um yeah connectors so they are like nine inches uh long yep. piece of piece of I cable those for basically the, um, so Michael they Studio kind of like solve well. that issue in that way uh, fact, I, know... I think we're using one right now in fact cut cutters cuts nathaniel's <laughs> camera so we're yes. looking now at the micro studio camera which has a mini bnc output am i right in thinking you've got a mini bnc that's to... right to female, yes. To that female, correct, that's yeah. what you're using there. Yes, exactly. that's right. Probably that would be the best way. They are very inexpensive, so I think that, and also there are many third parties that do any sort of like a variation of it. So I think it's probably the best way that's, to go. It's sort yeah. of just a little extension. But that's right. That's right. I mean, how do you find actually using that, Nathaniel? Um, I don't have any issue to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I think especially if you're not going to be, if, if the camera's going to be um, up and in a place. Uh, mm. stationary I don't think is an issue um, and depending on how you rig it as well I think you can make it work with a video assist as well yeah it just becomes you something that you add into the bag you know just alongside the video assist that's um, why I'm trying to put less stress on the connector itself mm -hmm. but just using that uh, that lead for uh, and that's a good point you could you can then stress um, relieve it with cable ties right. and stuff like that that's right and then still change your cable and take mm -hmm. your cable on and off without having exactly to, having to pull it and you know inadvertently and accidentally maybe yeah. break that uh, that good BNC point. that micro BNC connector absolutely um, okay Dennis says I would love to see an update um, with CF Express Type B and actual 480p support that's an interesting one but yeah CF Express Type B for, for future ones would be we're quickly moving towards that being mm -hmm. quite a, Depends, a good standard one doesn't it it's always a matter of like giving affordability giving, exactly mm -hmm. giving you access to something which is affordable as well um, those cards are brilliant because they, the data rate is, um, is phenomenal but obviously the price point is slightly different from an SD card <laughs> point of view and again having the ability of recording over USB-C, um, as we mentioned earlier, is also, I think, the uh, an affordable way to, to kind of give an alternative to SD cards in that case. Sure. Um, interesting question from Ray. This isn't specific to Blackmagic at all, but one I just thought I'd try and answer for you. Um, what lighting conditions are required for false color to work correctly, e.g. a sunny day versus overcast day will produce different lighting levels? So yes, the lighting on a sunny day versus an overcast day is very different. The the joy of false colour. Could we bring back up the the screen that had Absolutely. the false colour, Michael? Um, the, so the the joy of false colour is that it it tells you exactly what's going on there. So the way I personally use this is I use it to to set my skin tones in um, a piece of camera, that kind yeah. kind of thing, or an interview setup, anything like our our ones here. So I know exactly where that um, green and the pink, um, so 18% grey and um, one stop over 18% grey, sit on my particular skin tone. And we've done the same thing for each person here that um, is on camera. And then we can just make sure that those look the same no matter what situation I'm in. Whether I'm sat here at this desk, whether I'm out and about on the in a field, whether it's a bright day, whether it's a dim day, my skin should is the same skin. It should always look the same that's right this is exactly and what we said earlier then it just tells you has the now that i've set it to that so that my skin looks right is the sky way too bright or because it's a sunny day is the shadows way too dark because i'm outside at night in which case i need to do you need, I to, need to balance it? things you need, exactly. exactly you need to play with your with your screen you need to play yeah. with your flags so that's that's the craft behind that exactly. making sure you are within a range that the sensor can see properly so exactly. the craft is always yes, a lot in the of that lighting. is about dynamic range that's correct um but then obviously these, we don't these have color are range. generally read as sensor level the yes. uh yes you can play with the gain but the information that this sensor is is looking at is one and one only so you <coughs> reference that actually mm -hmm. Very cool. So, uh, Jamar also wants his name added to the list of people that want EL zone systems into the camera. We spoke about that a little bit earlier, Jamar, but um, but yeah, one more extra person on that feature That's request right. list. Uh, let's just 
see um, Michael says he loves the form factor of these devices. My only gripe is the location of the USB-C port. Mm -hmm. And Dennis actually agreed the USB-C port is definitely in the wrong place. It could also be a little bit stronger. So the USB-C is underneath. It's it, underneath. Right? It's underneath. Actually, very close to the to the uh, mounting points. So um, um, obviously, the cages. I quite like having cables underneath. The monitor because I then they prefer that because there's they less get, of a chance to get knocked exactly. and then yeah but I guess if um, they're close to the mounting point that's, they, that's I think I've seen a few uh, few cages as well because obviously don't forget in the market you you find quite a lot of different cages to be able to use it as a as a field monitor or sure. sometime I, mm -hmm. I you you give that to the to the uh, director and it's nice because they they can handle that uh, <coughs> quite nicely quite firmly and again sure. uh, when it's caged or rigged in, in such a way having a cable this sticks out it could be actually a bit uh, a bit not dangerous but maybe less forgiving so actually from the bottom is is plausible and i think is is the best position yes but i do agree that perhaps if i were to be critical on, on ourselves is that is, there is a lack of the um um maybe a thread or lockable um mm, usb -C, that would be good. which could be uh could be useful i, I get that but yeah. the positioning perhaps i'm, I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> to, to where it is to be honest yeah fair enough fair enough um <laughs> michael also says nathaniel is clutch on the video switching so <laughs> well done, <Nathaniel. laughs> And um, <coughs> one more feature request, I guess, from Norm, saying, would it be possible with a firmware update to include a still image capture and overlay feature? So where you onion skin sort of um, a previous mm. take over the top of this one or that kind of, or jump between, you know, the previous take and this that's take. A lovely, that's a lovely that feature request, actually. That's a definitely a feature request that, you know, we can, lo we can log in. Because um, I, I see the point on that. And I mean, that still then, you know, being able to... Uh, Perhaps again transfer that somehow uh, to your production even before they get the, uh, the, the get the content and start working on a, on a plate uh, before before actually you get the, the recording uh, done. So that that's a nice feature request. Request absolutely. Um, Norm also says the switching idea thing would be great. Um, and Jamal says, by the way, I love your channel. You think you guys are awesome. Thank you very much, Jamal. Thank you for watching. Um, cool. So should we should we yeah, wrap I think we can wrap up it up for, the, for today. To yeah. So we I think we mentioned how good this um, um, sort of field recording is, but it's not only a field recording. We understood how this is also a critical monitoring solution uh, over there. We offer robust codec mm. with our Apple S and uh, uh, and DNX. Um, we mentioned the Blackmagic RAW be such an important uh, recording option for third party uh, camera and the work that we put uh, into making sure that they got the right support, we got their support and we can see these, uh, these codec flourishing through uh, through this device. We've seen how useful those uh, uh, built-in scopes uh, are and how you tend to use them, uh, which, one, which one are the most popular. Uh, and thank you obviously for refreshing as well. Uh, uh, how you use a false color, for example, which is uh, super, super important. We look at the connectivity. We discussed just lately the, the BNC option, the HDMI, the ability of being a converter. So there are a lot of a lot of different uh, things, um, especially even, you know, when you use it as a field monitor, we mentioned the battery, the DC power, so the streaming capability and the different workflow. So um, I think I think is a is a box that it's actually a unit that ticks a lot of boxes um, mm. over there. Um, and again, we keep on working hard. I mean, even the last, the latest uh, update on the on the on the video series, typical black magic. Again, we never we never stop. We never stop like implementing stuff. I think the latest one was uh, introducing time code over XLR, something that it was requested so uh, for so long because some people were relying on SDI RP one eight eight and trigger record uh, the mm. unit, which by the way it is possible. Then they mentioned you know the the necessity of having a XLR time code input to then match those uh, those uh, those clips those content to other uh, to other devices and again we keep on working on that so I'm glad we have, we got so many feature 
request mm. uh, through, it's, through I mean, the there chat. always is on these streams. Uh, we always Peter's hear, actually you know, we keep our ears open. Uh, and the more, the, the better, because that means that you can get feedback sure. uh, to, to the developer team, which is working relentlessly to make sure that, obviously, we can accommodate the majority of it, if possible. Otherwise, they're definitely good food for thought for the next uh, generation of, you know, uh, and, product that... Uh, my or my not come come uh, come to life. Well, exactly. I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. you, you assume there's new products at some point, isn't there? But I mean, they, that's what I love about these live streams is that they can become this real sort of yeah, feedback absolutely. session. Um, and we love it. Absolutely. Peter's love it. actually talking about Black Magic Cloud integration as well. Now that you guys mm -hmm. got all that tech, yeah, integrating yeah. that somehow into the video assist lineup would be amazing. Wow. Can you imagine wherever we can it, go? I, I mean, mean, there's so many again, options. Again, we, we said that in the in the previous uh, webinar. We are very fortunate where we are. is is a unique position for us. We own all all the kits and all the bits. Exactly. You cover such to, a wide to spectrum. Actually, produce that 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 seamless workflow. So we we're very very fortunate there, and uh, I'm glad that this is also kind of like triggering somebody else's mind, saying, "Oh, that can be." Can become reality that could be possible if only and yeah. it's great because that means that you're looking into a solution you become more creative you actually keep you're not passive to your technology but you try to extrapolate the maximum out of it which is brilliant this is what you know technology should be all about you know improving based on what you got and not just for the sake of like yeah if i could only have a magic wand and you know have love you know love this isn't that of course you know it's it'd be lovely but we have to work with what we got sometime and sure. make the most out of it. Um, Michael's also asked, do you get access to DaVinci Resolve Studio with the purchase of the monitor? Like you do on the no, you stuff? don't. I don't think it no, is on the PS. No, this is only it? limited to the uh, to the cameras, so and some, the some of the cameras in DaVinci Resolve mm -hmm. and the speed editors uh, as well, so the, the yep. panels as well. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay, cool. So obviously, if um, any of you out there um, are thinking about buying anything from Blackmagic or any of these video assists or anything from any of the other brands as well, uh, <laughs> head over to ProV. Um, thank you very much for watching these. And thank you, Michael, for thank joining me Thank you guys again. for watching. And thanks, Yuka, once again for having me today. It's been a pleasure. No problem at all. Thank you. Take care, um, and I'll see you all very soon.
I'm the damn 